Roger, I found you in Malaysia. <laughs> We've been looking for you for ages. Uh, we know of you as the author of a book, one of the few books that existed when I started to study translation in 1991. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that book and what it was trying to achieve at that period? Okay. Um, well, I should tell you first why it was 1991. Should I be looking at the camera, by the way, or looking at him? Look me. Absolutely. Looking at him. Yes, I'm absolutely. sorry. Right. Okay, but first of all, let me tell you why it was 1991. Um, 1991 was the 200th anniversary of the publication of Titler's um, Principles of Translation, which was the first full-length book on the principles of translation. So it was the, the bicentenary um, of the publication, and I thought well, that was a, a, good, a good time to get it out. Um, what was behind the book was, uh, I mean, partly an excuse for me to demonstrate that I knew about uh, systemic functional grammar. <laughs> right. right. It's a, it's a so linguistic based book. It's a very linguistic based book, and essentially what I did was to say, um, most of the people, and we're talking now 25 years ago, in fact, 20 years ago, um, most of the people working in the translation um, actually don't know very much linguistics. And if you think of the sorts of books that were around at the time, I think I was correct that, that there were a few people who did, but most of the people were very much into the kind of history of ideas Yes. way of looking at, at translation. The, the, the title was uh, trans, Translation and Translating. Is that a significant yes. difference? Yes, absolutely. How does that um, work? Well, I, I wanted translation as the super audio, uh, superordinate mm -hmm. term and also for the product of the process. Yes. And I wanted translating as the process itself. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, <laughs> um, so essentially what, what I wanted to do was produce a book that said, look, here's a lot of things uh, about language, especially about English, which I, is the only one I know a lot about. Um, some of these things might be helpful for translators. So I'm not writing it as a translator, I'm writing it as a linguist sure. saying, um, I think you're missing an angle on what you're doing when you're looking at translation. So I, I when people have said there's not a lot of translation in it, I, I, I don't make excuses. I just say, well, I'm not a translator. I'm just were, somebody were you, interested in it. Had you translated? Were you translating at the time? Uh, I, I, I've done a bit, but very little. I, I, um, no, I, I mean, I, I think it's silly to say I, I am or was a translator. So in, in the 1990s, if I'm not wrong, you were at the University of Westminster. That's right. In London. In London. And you were engaged in setting up translation courses more modifying than okay, setting up okay. because um, Westminster which was the old Polytechnic of Central London which was the old Regent Street Polytechnic which was the original Polytechnic Institution founded I think in 1832 um, had had language study and so forth from the very beginning and had had language translation courses running really for 30-40 years okay. and translation uh, technical and specialized translation uh, was one that had been running a long time, the MA course. Um, uh, the, at the time, the only um, IEC recognized conference interpreters training program. In, in Britain? In Britain. Okay. Oh, yes. yes. In Britain. So, what was your job there? I was, um, I was a head of school because it was a huge faculty. Um, we taught 50 or 60 languages, actually. Um, so, I was uh, I was sort of, you know, head of linguistics and uh, and and so on. And my my main remit was was to help the the university, which had been a polytechnic, um, to to build a research culture. Because when I first got there, there were maybe half a dozen people out of a staff of getting on for a hundred who were publishing research. And when I left, there were about half a dozen who weren't. Okay. So that was my real remit to, to teach and do research and to generally in linguistics people. or in all the, right. the, the, the lot okay. really. We know that period as a period when the, the courses were set up in public service interpreting. Right. Were, were you involved in that? I, I was definitely because um, the 
what happened was that, that, that there was um, a frightful court case which uh, people in the field know about um, of a, an Indian woman who was who pleaded guilty to murder and was given a mandatory life sentence and uh, three years later it was discovered that the interpreter because she only spoke Punjabi wasn't an interpreter he was an accountant and he didn't speak Punjabi um, so of course the case was just thrown out and she was released and on the basis of that the the, the judges essentially said this is frightful because there must be other miscarriages of justice that we just don't know about. And that led to the setting up of the public services, uh, trans sorry, the public service uh, interpreting training mm -hmm. and list and the training of those people. And I was on the, I was the linguistics advisor to the, the Nuffield committee, which set it up um, and funded it. Indeed, most of the money came from the Nuffield Foundation. So I, I was very involved in that from, from the very beginning. And, and that's a field that's really taken off since then. Uh, yeah. Both at Westminster, but it's spread out all over oh, the world. Well, yes. I'm, I mean, increasingly people... Legal interpreting, court interpreting, I think, has been going for a long time in, in many countries. Um, how satisfactory that is and how well-trained the interpreters are is very, very patchy. But, but also as a research field. Oh, as a research field too, yes. Um, I, I'll come back to that if I may. Um, what has been missing until very recently has been medical and social service interpreting, where uh, what's tended to happen is that um, if, if you're ill, um, some member of your family will go and interpret for you, right. or if you need to go to a government office, somebody will go and help you. Um, but the idea that there should be professionals trained to do that is, is relatively new. Um, the, now, what did I say I'd come back to? I'm so sorry. Um, something to do with court interpreting. I, I want to go back, right back. <laughs> All right. I want okay. to go right back to when you were 22, 23, 24. I mean, you got into linguistics, but how did you get to there? Um, by mistake. Good. <laughs> That's what happens to us all. Right? <laughs> That's right. Um, I did my first degree in history, and the reason I did my first degree in history was because uh, when I got my A-level results... You're, you're in England. Though. This you're was in England. Very English, English. Yes, yes. And my head, the headmaster said, well, you've got an A-level in English literature, he said, history and French, so you can do literature, history, or French at university. And I said, being a brash 18-year-old, I said, well, my French is good enough, don't think I want to do any more. Um, I read literature all the time, so I'd better do history. So I did. And, and I don't regret that. I think for a, a, a bumptious 18-year-old who thought he knew everything, history was a very good discipline in both senses of the word. Um, however, in the course of doing that, I specialised on the High Renaissance in Italy. And in the course of that, I learned at least to read Italian and speak a little bit. And then I did my education year, my fourth year, to get an education qualification. In the middle of my teaching practice, teaching history, I thought, this is horrible. I really do not want to spend my life doing this. Um, and I got a job in Italy as an English teaching assistant in Rome. Um, two years. First year was the school. Second year, I worked for the Palazzo Antici Mattei, which is an American-Italian um, language study center. Um, that was run by Paul Roberts, who at the time was one of the few people in the world who understood what Chomsky was talking about. And he trained us to teach, and he used syntactic structures as the textbook. Okay. Uh, yes, quite. So if, if, you, if you could work out, as we were supposed to, what the relationship was between syntactic structures, the book, and teaching Italians to speak English, well, you were in. And I, I was enjoying that a lot. And one day Paul Roberts said to me, you know, you don't, you're not interested in languages. And I said, rubbish, I'm fascinated by languages. No, he said, you're interested in language. And it went, pling. Mm -hmm. And he said, it's called linguistics. Okay. And then I went back to Britain and I taught immigrants and I did a, a research MA on the English of immigrants in Birmingham. But your line as a linguist has been far more holiday than, well, than totally. Chomsky does. <laughs> totally. That, that happened later then. That happened when I was doing my research, and I, I wasn't supervised by, um, uh, sorry, 
uh, by John Sinclair, but he was, in fact, the head, he was appointed professor at the time I was there. So I, I was certainly influenced by, by his thinking Where was there for Halliday, Birmingham. Birmingham, Birmingham. 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 Yes. And on the basis of that, I got a job teaching in the English department at the new University of Lancaster. Okay. So I was a founder member of Lancaster. Okay. Um, and then I did applied linguistics, and I did sociolinguistics, and I didn't do anything to do with languages as such, um, until lots of other things happened, but uh, until I got a job, the job at Westminster, um, and inherited Peter Newmark's chair, and read what he was publishing, and thought, well, I, I can do, if not better, then something very different. Different, yes. So I did. Well, Newmark is not a linguist in that sense. But, but no. No, I mean a very, very practical translator. Yes, yes. Let me fast forward now. Um, we knew you at that time mm. around mm. European British translation studies and linguistics, and then you disappeared <laughs> and reappeared here in, in Malaysia. Can you tell us a bit about that and what you're doing, what you have been doing here? Well, um, I mean, what happened was that I, I took early retirement from Westminster because. I was sick of counting paper clips. I mean, you know what happens. You end up doing administration, administration, and you don't do what you love doing, which is research mm -hmm. and teaching. You know? I know. And I said, yeah. <laughs> so I, I said, look, I, I, I want to get out of this. If I'd wanted to be an accountant, I'd have done a degree in accountancy. Goodbye. So I took early retirement, and I went to Brazil. And I was in Brazil for a year. And while I was in Brazil, I got an email from the Doan Bahasa, here, the, the uh, um, Academy of, of Malay Language and Literature, um, and they said, we, we've got a, a conference um, in Johor Bahru, um, would you like to be the keynote speaker? Well, this was 1995 or six or something around there, and I thought, well, it's, it's 20 years, really, since I've, I've been in Southeast Asia, because I was in Singapore for two years. and. Um, so why not? And uh, I sent them a message saying, um, good news, I, I, I will come. Um, the bad news is I'm in Brazil. Uh, the good news is I've got a ticket back to London and if I can bunch my teaching up, I can leave a little bit early. So I came um, and met my now wife, who teaches here in the University of Malaya, and uh, have never looked back, literally. <laughs> Tell us about the situation of languages and translation, and perhaps the need for translation studies in Malaysia. It's really quite slow, um, what's happening. Uh, USM at Penang, University of Science Malaysia, uh, had started a course, um, a four-year course initially in translation and interpreting. Uh, it was cut back to a three-year course. And that was, um, intriguingly, that was resun uh, sorry, um, run by a student of mine from Westminster mm -hmm. who had secondment to design the course. Mm -hmm. um, so I was, I was the kind of midwife for the creation of that. Um, and they've been running that uh, really quite successfully, I think, but very quietly. You don't hear a lot about it uh, since, I suppose, the mid-90s, mid really, early 90s, early mid-90s. Um, University um, Malaya, where we are, um, started off with a, a, a big program, um, training interpreters, training court interpreters in particular, um, but that faded away over the years for reasons which I, I don't know, um, and very recently, over the last two or three years, there, there have been plans to start a minor in translation um, within the faculty of <coughs> languages and linguistics. Because um, paradoxically, although translation isn't taught at the moment, um, a lot of students doing the MA do their theses in translation. Mm -hmm. So there's so interest. Tremendous in interest, students. yes. And, and a growing interest amongst the staff of the faculty. Um, also, a very interesting project going on on the, the deaf community mm -hmm. um, and uh, trying to work out, describe their their Malaysian Sign Language. And that's a new study, and the, the lead researcher in that is herself deaf, mm -hmm. um, and a native speaker, native signer yes. um, of the language. Um, 
Do you think that there are specific problems that have to be worked on in Southeast Asia that are not, can't be dealt with by Western translation studies? I think that there's, there are kind of fundamental pre problems um, always of the relationship between the translator and the client. Okay. Uh, that the, the client is understandably uh, unaware of what's involved mm -hmm. um, and appalled at the, the price and, and all the rest of it. And so this is, I think, a universal problem. And again, it's very patchy in some, some countries, translators and or interpreters are professionalized, um, in others they're not. So this is happening very slowly here. Um, there is a, a, a de jure um, accreditation organization for translators, mm -hmm. which is the, the National Institute for Translation here in Kuala Lumpur. But I say de jure because um, they, they, are, they are appointed to do it, um, but they, they don't do it in, in any way which, which we would accept, I think, because there's very little quality assurance um, and, and you become recognized just by registering. Well, that's okay. a bit like putting yourself in the yellow pages. I think these are problems with the profession. Mm. Uh, I'm more interested in research. Let's say you were here, you are here, and you were 22, 23, 24 again. <laughs> what sort of things would you want to do research on? Do you think research should be done on? Well, I wouldn't just want to do translation. Good. I, I, Good. I mean, I'd want to do lots of, lots of things. Um, there are, there are a, num I mean, a, a few things that come quickly to mind and then some translation ones will, I think. Um, I'm very interested in the fact that, that there is increasing um, labor mobility within the ASEAN countries mm -hmm. as ASEAN gets its act together more and more. This um, is the Association of Southeast, Southeast, Southeast Asian, Asian Nations. Yes. That's right. Um, so what, what very typically is happening, that whereas Singapore is actually bringing in um, talent from all over the world, um, what's coming into Malaysia is, is talent of various kinds from neighboring countries, from Thailand, from Indonesia in particular, um, the Philippines, uh, but also from Bangladesh, for example, and even from West Africa. So that there's a lot of people coming into Malaysia um, where they, in fact, do all sorts of things from being domestic servants to building workers and so forth. One of the reasons for that, I think, is although the official language of the country is Malay, um, you will have noticed that everybody speaks English. And that's not the case with Indonesia, which is less than an hour's flight away. You know? So I, I think that means if, you know, if, I'm a, if I'm a Nigerian and I want to go somewhere, or if I'm an Uzbek, or something. I, I can come here and I can operate in English. And I, I think. So, do you think we should be looking at new forms of migration and the linguistic consequences of that? I think we should be looking at that. We should be looking at, at the relationship between language and, and social mobility. Mm -hmm. um, and there's then the knock on effect, uh, for example, in, in the legal system, um, that the demand for, say, um, bungler interpreters is, uh, is way, way beyond the provision because there is only one okay. for thousands and thousands of uh, Bangladeshi workers. So there's that. The other one which I would, I would love to study before it dies out um, is uh, Bazaar Malay, which is a pigeonized variety of Malay, which is not spoken by Malays, obviously, because they speak Malay. Um, but uh, to, uh, to a, a considerable extent by older Indians and Chinese who will speak Tamil. It's a kind of pigeon. It's a pigeon. No, it's, yes, it's a bizarre right. Malay. Okay. It's, it's, right. you know, it is, uh, it's for business, which okay. is what okay. pigeon was. Okay. Now, uh, that is, that's dying out, literally, as the speakers die yeah. out, uh, because the educational system uh, is producing people whose Malay is very good. Very often, um, the Malay of, of Chinese and, and Indian students is just as good as that of Malay students sometimes even better.